Okay, Mr. Riley, we're ready. Okay. Um, I'm going to call to order the Student Programs and Services Committee meeting, Wednesday, March 17th, 2021. It's now 6.30 p.m. or past. This meeting is being held virtually in accordance with the governor's guidelines. All right, Sally, um, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I am super excited about tonight's meeting. We have uh, two main topics on our agenda, social emotional learning and science curriculum, two of my most favorite topics. And we have some amazing teachers uh, and building principals here to talk about the work um, they've been doing on these topics. So I am going to actually uh, turn it over to the elementary, a couple of representatives from our elementary uh, curriculum um, group to, um, Sorry, I'm watching the screen uh, to start off on our presentation and then we'll move to the middle school group and the, and the high school group. And I think what you'll be hearing and what you might listen for are a lot of similarities. Well, these are three separate committees. They've taken some similar journeys, yet different parts, uh, different journeys because elementary and middle high school look different, but with some similar goals and outcomes at the end. Um, tailored based upon feedback from the committee and also to meet our ne uh, needs of our students at those various levels. So I'm excited to turn it over to the elementary group um, and I am actually going to let them introduce themselves first um, for each committee um, and talk a little bit about uh, introduce themselves, where they work, um, and maybe a little bit about why they joined the committee as they start their presentation. So Becky, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Um, so I'm Becky Granatini, and I am an elementary content area curriculum specialist. Um, and I've been very interested in the evolution of our selection of a social emotional learning program. Um, personally, I just feel that we need to attend to the social emotional needs of our students um, before we even begin to really connect with those academic areas. Um, Obviously, we know we're in the midst of a pandemic, and that also is kind of one of the key parts to, um, you know, really putting a lot of time and emphasis on the and a, a great selection process for the social emotional learning project. Um, and it's it, this is this whole experience has been has been fabulous. Um, we have a fabulous team here today. Um, and we're excited to share sort of our process with you as well as um, what our, our recommendations are. Um, so I'd like to maybe pass off to Patrick. Sally, you've got a switching between Zoom and Google Meet, so I have to. Um, okay. So uh, my name is Patrick Cohn, and I, I am the principal over at Hanmer Elementary School. And uh, like Becky, I'm very excited to be a part of this committee. Um, and, and I too share her uh, sentiment that um, you know the social emotional piece of our, our for our students and our staff, frankly, uh, is really critical. Um, as we all know, as educators, you know, if our kids are not ready to access their learning, uh, they won't be successful academically. So to meet them where they are and to really um, find a good program that's going to help our our teachers to meet them where they are, uh, it's been an exciting journey, and uh, I, I'm excited to to present this with the team tonight. Maria? Um, my name is Maria Aparo. I am a kindergarten teacher at Hamner. Um, SEL has been near and dear uh, to me for several years. I worked with young children even before coming to um, teach um, public school. Um, it's always been one of my big interests and, and a big place that I think kids really need that boost. They need to feel loved and they need to feel safe and they need to know that when they're at school, they're, they're feeling those comforts from the adults that work with them. Um, most recently, I am working on my doctorate and SEL was a big topic um, for me that I researched and I actually researched a teacher's opinions of SEL training. So being a part of this committee was really exciting to see how that research that I did most recently kind of fit in with the way that we presented it and really brought it home to the staff and made um, everyone feel inclusive in the process. So that was um, that was an exciting piece for me. So I'm happy to be here. Great, thank you. I think Becky. 
Yeah, so, um, so tonight we're going to be sharing with you part of our process um, <clears throat> of the social emotional um, learning and we're going to start with um, the elementary level and again, um, I'm hoping like Sally mentioned that you'll hear some kind of commonalities between all of our processes and um, leading up to why we think the program that we're recommending um, is, is likely a very good fit. Um, and so I'm going to share part of our process was we really started to look, we looked at Simon Sinek um, and some of his work in um, just developing the why. Um, like, why are we out there looking for a social emotional program right now? Um, and even beyond like sort of transcending um, what's happening right now in terms of our pandemic, really thinking about um, what is leading us um, at this point to be looking for something that that really meets our needs in a lot of different ways. Um, so we came together, we talked about how success really needs to be driven by the why that we, you know, we need to get on the same page and understand um, what the important most key elements of a program would be to us and how um, our selection of a program, um, like what are the different elements of it that are most important to us. So we came together as um, a lot of different sort of iterations of um, a, a selection group. Um, we started with one committee that was, um, was um, with volunteers. It was a volunteer process. We came forward and, and learned about some of the different um, programs that were available. And we talked about um, the CASEL standards, which are the um, social emotional learning standards. Um, and we just, we thought about like what important elements um, do we need to be sure that they include um, to meet the needs of our students. Um, and so as we did that, we brought our um, staffs together and we looked at um, what at the elementary level um, among these teams, what we thought was sort of our why, like why are we at this point selecting a new program? One of the things that we do know and we do recognize is that um, we originally had been planning to go with second step. Um, and we were kind of on board with that and beginning the process with that. Um, and then we hesitated and slowed down on that and eventually stopped that process because we were concerned over equity um, and what we felt were concerns over um, how individuals are being represented um, within some of the images um, and, and just there, from the equity lens, um, we didn't feel that it was a good match. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a positive inclusive type of model. So we um, decided to kind of end our um, process there with them. And that's part of, that's, a, that's another kind of piece of our why. Um, so then we began looking at our other programs. Um, within the elementary level, there were a couple of sort of resounding um, sort of why statements that were made. Um, included in those were, um, you know, leveling the playing field, creating that equity for students, right? Like recognizing, like Patrick mentioned, that our, our learners are coming to the, coming to the table, that um, they are ready to learn, right? And because we know that if you are not, if you don't have your basic needs being met um, in sort of our hierarchy of needs, that you're not going to be ready to learn. Um, so that was kind of a resounding statement that we heard across um, different individuals from different sort of parts of our school community and stakeholders. Um, another was that we wanted to be proactive. We don't always, you know, we don't want to wait um, until there's a concern or an issue. We really want to be um, you know, thinking of what our children might be facing, um, what types of challenges they might be having, and really how we can be sort of instilling, you know, whether it's character traits or um, some, some strategies, lots of different types of strategies that can help them to be, um, you know, feel more well-rounded, to be good friends, um, and to be able to develop academically as well as socially in a way that's you know gonna impact them the, the best um, over time, right? Like we don't want them to just be successful for a single year. We want them to become lifelong learners and to have a, a lifetime of positive experiences. And then one of the other key things is that we really wanna support them in sort of their executive functioning, right? Um, 
it's we know that it's challenging. We think of our students right now, they are learning across settings. They are learning in a multitude of different ways um, and with so many different types of messages coming, coming at them. And knowing how to process and organize their thinking, um, I can't even imagine what it must be like for a seven-year-old. Um, so we know that it's important for them to have sort of some avail, you know, obviously the availability for learning, but also um, some strong executive functioning skills so that they'll be prepared to be learners in our classrooms. And I'm going to hand it over to Maria at this point. All right, I hope I don't freeze. I feel like I keep buffering. So if I'm like making a funny face, I don't mean to be. Um, so our committee, um, as far as our process, um, we reviewed several evidence-based SEL programs that were recommended by CASEL and the standards were created over two decades ago. Um, our members reviewed each potential program independently. Um, we participated in presentations from other prospective companies ask precise questions um, to make the best decision for our district. The school representatives from the SEL committee brought that information back to their home schools and set up virtual focus groups. Um, this was an avenue used to open up the conversation um, to any interested staff. In some cases, a representative from RethinkEd, um, the person, John, that we worked with very closely, um, he was there to answer questions, to give overview, um, and very generously giving of his time. Um, the staff were given access to the website and um, were able to look at the lessons and, and look over that portal and investigate it before joining and making an informed decision or being able to ask extra questions. Um, I could go to the next slide, Becky. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, no, no, that's okay. Um, so why did it, it um, stand out for us? Um, well, based on all the feedback from the schools and the work of the SEL committee, um, we really felt that Rethink Ed met the needs of our students and um, population and our families, of course. Um, the topics of the lessons um, are current, they're support and they're supportive to our population, um, even across our district. Um, Rethink, Ed, Rethink Ed meets the needs of our teachers and the program aligns with our district goals, that information that's gonna be expanded on in some slides um, that Mr. Cohn will talk about. Um, and the training and support offered by Rethink Ed um, is vast and they will help us establish a scope and sequence based on the needs and um, basing on themes and the needs of our district as a whole. Um, the SEL committee will collaborate with other interested staff and leadership teams and be able to decide on the most vital themes that we will use in our district. Um, and then this slide here lists the SEL topics, awareness and awareness of self and other, self-management, social skills, social awareness, and self-care. Those are all very valuable um, for the well-being of our students and our families. And um, our committee is just really proud to present this very inclusive program. And I would just like to add that um, one of the um, key parts of, if you notice, there are um, there are different lessons under sort of these different topic areas. Um, one of the things that we are going to put a strong emphasis on is in creating district-wide themes um, so that we can kind of have a continuity that goes across our elementary schools. Um, I think we think it'll help in terms of teachers being able to kind of collectively, um, you know, work together through, you know, across different schools. It will also be helpful in our communication with families um, because we'll be able to send out a lot of the same messaging around the same kinds of um, larger themes. And it will hopefully, what we're hoping is it's going to help us to develop a nice sense of community, um, sort of as a, you know, like a, a wraparound to the program itself. Um, so, so we're looking at how we how we can layer in um, the most effective scope and sequence um, to meet the needs of our students and our families. Oh, I'm up. Um, so, you know, one of the uh, one of the most important things that we know as educators is the connection and partnership between family and school and home and school. 
And one of the things that, that's really important to us and, and that we've also learned over the course of the, the last several years is that behavior, you know, we've begun in education to start treating uh, behavior similarly to, to how we treat academics uh, and, and understanding that there's a process to behaviors and behaviors are communication. So uh, that, that home and school partnership has become increasingly important. And the, one of the nice parts about Rethink Ed is that there's actually built-in tools that allow teachers to communicate with home. So there are arrangements around school-wide themes across grade levels to build on integration and school-wide sharing, which kind of speaks to what Becky was just talking about. We'll be able to do that across district, which uh, again, in the, the silver linings playbook to the pandemic, I have to say as an administrator, there's been an increased amount of collaboration, not only across buildings as administrators, but also among our teachers across buildings, which, is, uh, which has been really nice to see. So this will, will help to continue that effort. Uh, it is visually appealing, which uh, we know it has to have a, a nice, nice look to it for us to be uh, engaged with it at times. So, definitely something that that was that caught our eye as well, um, and it also helps to support our teachers with with already you know kind of pre-created home connection letters, parent access to SEL videos, uh, which will allow parents to actually know what's going on in school and continue some of those same efforts uh, at home. Um, and they have a resource toolkit for parents, which is fairly easy to use um, and that, that our families will have access to. Oh, sorry, okay. That's okay. Um, it is web-based, so it can be used for in-person, hybrid or remote, which again, if we've learned anything over the last year, flexibility is key. So this is actually a very nice uh, option for that. Uh, and it is actually accessible through Google Classroom. Uh, it's very easy to navigate and does have very specific scope and sequence, which is nice for our teachers. It really, um, you know, my, my impression was it was very teacher friendly and that seemed to, Maria, correct me if I'm wrong, really be the feedback that we received uh, across the, the process. Um, yeah, no, for sure. Um, a lot of the teachers were um, happy, you know, first overwhelmed slightly with the portal, but then when we were able to help them navigate through and you can see just how many things are built right in there and how convenient it was and how well presented it was, everybody kind of like took a, a sigh of relief. <laughs> Definitely. And, and actually to that point, you know, you can see it, you know, it's nice to see things like it's over 500 easy to use lessons, but that can also be somewhat overwhelming. That's a lot of resources and a lot of information, but um, that actually does the, the, the support. One of the impressive things, at least that, that I had an impression from was the support that we're gonna receive from the, the, the group, the company, um, that the professional development that will be available to us uh, and that will be available to our teachers to allow them to really uh, dig in and learn these tools and, uh, and, and utilize them fairly quickly. Um, and of course, there's uh, academic connections and integration right into our themes uh, in our classrooms. And again, uh, the outcomes do align with our district goals. As Maria pointed out earlier, it's aligned with CASEL and built on evidence-based strategies, which is very important. Um, it is, you know, and again, one of the nice features when we talked, Becky mentioned, uh, some of the issues that we ran into with second step with equity and equality um, and kind of the representation that we saw in that. Um, this does have a dual language with English and Spanish supports. Um, it is, um, there's technical assistance and implementation support for that, which is again, um, the way it was explained really is, is teacher friendly and supportive of, of them doing the work uh, in the trenches. So. The next steps for us is students, uh, next steps are student self-assessment and teacher observational assessments as well. So it gives them kind of the guide as they go. And so here we are, we're, we're at a place where we've had the opportunity to review um, several different programs, um, to present them, to share them, to work through them with a lot of different kind of um, small groups, large, and you know, presenting to the larger group to offer um, opportunities to share and review the program with staff. Um, so now we're at a place where we're we're hearing a lot of positives, as hopefully you've kind of heard through through our presentation this evening. So now we're thinking about our implementation plan. Um, we've um, we've come up with um, we've we've certainly spent quite a bit of time as. Um, in our iteration, all these different iterations we have of sort of this SEL group. Um, and we've and we've thought a lot about sort of the timing on how we move this forward. Um, 
and we recognize that teachers, you know, the, 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 one of the worst things you can do is all of a sudden drop a new program right at the beginning of the school year. That can be a very difficult thing. So we wanted to begin to roll this out um, with some professional development in May um, to sort of introduce the platform. Um, we will not have our entire working scope and sequence at that point because that's something that we're actually going to need to develop over the summer um, in coordination with um, the team with Rethink. Um, that's part of their um, professional development um, services that they'll you know, be offering to us is the time to work together with them to develop that scope and sequence and prioritize lessons and whatnot. Um, but we definitely want to provide the opportunity and some professional development as to um, the program itself um, to offer um, the login information so people can um, get up and running with it to, um, to understand the process, how it works. Um, and um, that, you know, then that kind of leads to the summer curriculum work that we know will need to be done. Um, and so that will include, again, like I mentioned, developing that scope and sequence. As Patrick mentioned, you know, 500 lessons is completely overwhelming. We absolutely are aware of that. And we're going to, the idea is that we develop something that's very reasonable. Um, we prioritize lessons and we come up with something that's easy to follow and predictable. Um, additionally, we want to come up with plans for shared communications and methods of rollout, just so that we have consistency across the district. So, um, you know, similar messages going to parents at all of the different schools. So some of that work will be done across, you know, during that summer curriculum work um, to ensure that that's, it doesn't become, you know, a scramble at the beginning of the year. We'd like to have it set to go so that this becomes a, a uh, you know, ideally somewhat of a seamless um, roll out in the fall. And of course, we'd like to thank, as I mentioned, we've had a lot of different um, um, parts to this committee. Um, and we just are so thankful to the time this this has um, taken some time, right? Because um, there are a lot of different parts of this program. We really wanted to spend the time to um, dig into the different aspects of it. So we had some wonderful representation within our group. We had administrators, curriculum specialists, several different um, grade level teachers, um, you know, school psychologists, social workers, um, you know, director of special services, supervisor, and Sally assistant superintendent. So. Um, and then this, these are the people that uh, joined us with some, you know, some formality. Of course, we have a lot of other people that have been sort of digging in and perusing within our schools themselves that have been attending um, some of our focus group kind of rollout meetings as well. So um, for all those people that have um, taken the time to help us to dig in and make sure that this is a good fit, we are very thankful. Thank you so much. I'd like to hand it off to our middle school update. So um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Diana Beardsley. I'm a science teacher at the middle school. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to be involved in SEL is um, I've worked with advisory for as long as it's been around eight or nine years. Um, and um, also, I'm also going back for my special ed certification because there's a lot of different behaviors and, and different types of students that I wanna be able to reach. Um, and sometimes I feel like I don't have enough knowledge and background to do that, which is one of the reasons why I'm going back to get um, certif certified. And I just feel like this is just an important part for all students. And um, that's why I wanted to be a part of the SEL committee. And Julie, I will wanna take a minute. Hi, I'm Juliana Klein. I'm one of the school psychologists at the middle school. Um, I also support at the high school with testing. Um, so SEL is kind of my daily work. Um, so I'm super passionate about it. And I'm really excited that the district is choosing to kind of roll this out um, at the tier one level. And I was excited to be part of that and you know, part of choosing the evidence-based program. So Amanda, I think you're next. Hi, I'm Amanda Brennan. I'm a special ed teacher at the middle school and I co-teach our human relations program with Julie, uh, which is a, a program um, set up and designed for our students with social emotional disabilities. Uh, so we're hoping bringing this SEL work into tier one and supporting the students 
as, as a whole, um, you know, we'll ideally bring some of the strategies that have supported our higher needs students um, into the school as a whole, and hopefully we'll, um, you know, reduce potentially some of our needs with special ed servicing around social emotional um, concerns. Uh, and I've really enjoyed being a part of the SEL work uh, at SDMS since the beginning of the year. Becky, can you move it? To sure. The Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> um, so I'm just, our why is going to sound very similar to the elementary school with a little twist towards middle school. Um, we quickly realized that not all students, um, it's not a level playing field. And, and that's something that we really wanted um, to focus on is, and um, as you'll see, I think it's great because we're going to be um, going with a similar program as the elementary school. So it's it's just going to be a level playing field as far as common understanding and common language. Um, one of the things I just want to share with that is um, Weathersfield is such a great and diverse community. And every year I have a different set of needs with my students. My students last year have different needs than my students this year have. And I just feel like with the program that we selected, we're gonna be able to meet those needs no matter you know where students are at. Um, another thing I'm learning is when you're stressed, I've learned this in school um, and, and a science teacher, your brain physiologically cannot focus, cannot get those executive functioning skills working and, and cannot pay attention and, and do well um, and focus in class you're more reactive and maybe we see some behaviors for that or maybe we're seeing kids just shutting down and not being able to um, do the best they can in school. So um, just teaching skills on, um, you know, related to anxiety or stress will help in, the, in academics. Another thing that you cannot see, but I really wanna point out um, for middle school is really to normalize struggles um, with these students, you know, students are so afraid in middle school not to be like every other middle schooler, and they feel like what's going on with them is is not what everybody else is dealing with. And we really want them to feel like a lot of feelings and emotions you may have are, are normal feelings that everybody has, and you're not, we're just not focusing it, you know, we're not, people may not share them with you, um, and really give them a place to be, have support, um, and, and just feel understood, because I think that's a big challenge in middle school. And then um, soft skills, you know, you can teach um, the smartest student to be a great, you know, great in science, but um, if they don't have the, you know, they can't control their anxiety or, or they don't have those social emotional skills. And um, that's what the workplace is looking for. And we're, we're not at the workplace, but we're getting them ready for the high school. So, and we felt that those were really important, um, important whys, like why, um, you know, why we should do this, uh, focus on SEL. And, and there are similar reasons in terms of what the elementary school said. So I will. All right, so our process uh, with our work with SEL started uh, really from, you know, the beginning of the teacher work week before school started. Uh, we had a small group um, work with uh, kind of digging more into the CASEL standards and really taking a look at how we, can, we as a school can um, focus on SEL this year. Uh, that was a really large message from admin. Um, Roslyn is here. Thanks for your support with all of this. Um, Roslyn and Cindy made it really clear that that was our goal um, for this year was to embed the social emotional learning into all of our activities um, in as much of our instruction as possible to support our students with everything going on right now. Um, so then after we, uh, the, small, the small group worked on um, figuring out and relooking at some of those standards and where we were going to go, uh, we provided staff with um, a Google Drive folder of some quick SEL strategies that they could use in their classrooms. Um, and um, we really wanted the focus to be on uh, supporting relationships with students um, and checking in on their well being. Um, we also, the this, this small group, um, the S, kind of before the the pre-SEL SEL committee, uh, we came up with some 
um, activities to support adult SEL. We really recognized that that was something that needed to be incorporated into the work as a whole school community. Um, so we had an awesome uh, PD time uh, where kind of the staff and we talked about staff strategies for SEL and how that can relay into the classroom um, when they're focusing on their students' social emotional learning. Um, so then once the SEL committee was formed as part of this process to look at uh, which you know direct instruction program we were going to be going with, uh, again, similar to elementary schools, we reviewed second step. Um, we really dug into it and, and you know, found that there were some great parts about it, um, but we were really glad to hear that the elementary schools and the middle and the high school were also looking at Rethink Ed. Uh, we really talked about you know, us being in that middle space to make sure that our work was aligning with the elementary school and the high school. Um, so some of us in the SEL committee attended the presentation for the Rethink Ed. Um, and Julie's going to talk about kind of why we why we really decided uh, why the rethink ed was a was the best fit for us as a middle school, um, and then we did bring in some of the team uh, the team leaders uh, to the SEL committee to really kind of talk about how we could implement this uh, in a way that fits our middle school model the best. Thank you. Okay, so like Amanda said, we looked at second step and then we ultimately decided to go with Rethink Ed and just like the elementary school, there is a ton of similarities. Um, what we really liked about Rethink Ed was that there's these three tiers of intervention. So we had that first tier that we could roll out globally and then they provide, um, you know, tier two and tier three interventions for our kids. Um, they also provide a student progress monitoring tool with the program, which is very helpful. Again, just like the elementary school, there is that parent engagement component, which is huge when you talk about social emotional learning. And there is also an adult SEL component for staff that we liked because you know I've always learned that if you don't practice it, how can you teach it? So I think that is also very important. Um, again, it's very easy to integrate with our existing technology. The format is super friendly. Um, the lessons are very clear and you know, scripted for staff, which is nice. The scope and sequence is, is a little bit flexible so we can choose kind of how we want it to go, how many lessons we do, which is really nice as well. Um, and then I, what we also liked was that Rethink Ed also provides us with that personalized assistant or that person that can help us with the implementation and scheduling moving forward which is really important to us at the middle school. And then in terms of our um, next steps, we really wanna educate um, the staff um, why SEL is important. Um, we've spent a lot of time digging in deep with the reasons why, but um, like Julie just said, in order to get buy-in, you know, we have to be, you know, pra practice mindfulness and, and, and uh, learn. And uh, we really want the staff to be able to understand the reasons why and come up with their own reasons why it's important. Um, so we're hoping to share that and even the district vision with the staff so that they can see the bigger picture. Um, then similar to the elementary school, we're gonna do a PD in May and um, start um, ask for some feedback from the staff, how certain um, sections may relate to their curriculum so that we can seamlessly put it into um, to uh, content and UA classes. We don't wanna make this another thing that has to be done. We wanna to try to make it as seamless as possible. So by getting their feedback and then working over the summer, um, we're hope, hopeful to have it all set for the beginning of the school year. And I will pass it to the high school after. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot about this one. Yep, so we also had a variety of um, uh, committee members. We had um, content teachers, uh, unified art teachers, support staff, of course, our administrators. Um, we had district administration, and then um, we had the team leaders just to get come in on the last couple of meetings just to get a different viewpoint. Um, and, you know, in the end, um, I will say that we had our last meeting today because we were successful at what we did and now we have to move to the implementation stage.
All right. Thank you. <laughs> I'll jump in for the high school now, if that's all right. <laughs> so um, I'm Stephanie McKenna, and I'm uh, an English teacher at the high school. I'm also the department liaison. And the reason I joined um, the SEL committee is because I think it's important just in general, but especially with the pandemic going on, it's even more important than it than it usually is. Um, and it's something that um, not, not every kid gets at home. And it's something I think we can definitely help out with at school um, because not only does it help in school, it helps with life skills um, and just life in general. So I think it's something that could be really beneficial. Um, there's a couple other high school representatives. So maybe I'll pass it off to Alicia, if you wanna mention, just say hello. Sure, thanks Steph. Um, so I'm Alicia Becker. I am uh, one of the Italian teachers at the high school. Um, and I joined the committee, um, you know, just because I see the benefits, you know, when I've tried to incorporate SEL into um, my classroom. Um, one of our committee members who's not here tonight, Victoria Martin said, you know, it's, it's just the kids who do have these skills, it's, it's a place where they can shine. Um, you know, it's just another skill set that, that's important for our students to hone. Um, and it's another way that our students can, um, can, you know, just sort of benefit from, you know, being in our classroom beyond the, the academic realm. Um, and also as a, as a parent um, of younger children, I've seen, you know, kind of firsthand the benefits of explicit SEL uh, instruction in, in their schools and, you know, having that common language. I know they talked about that at the elementary schools, um, you know, that we share, um, you know, as, as parents and as, you know, uh, school community members has been, has been hugely beneficial for, for my own children. So, you know, being a part of bringing that to, um, to our students at the high school felt really important. Thanks, Alicia. Um, Nella, do you wanna pop in? Nella, you're still on mute. <laughs> Pardon. Thank you, Sally. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Nella Salagi. I'm the high school librarian. And um, for me, it was important to be part of this committee because I do feel that social emotional learning is foundational, similar to um, what all my colleagues have said. Um, especially in building that relationship with students, but even more so, I love that the programs that we looked at um, also had the family and community component to it. And honestly, that foundation is what helps the kids be successful um, academically. I, like Nina said, they can't, um, you know, uh, focus on their academics if they're not feeling uh, balanced and well-equipped emotionally. Um, so this is why I joined. Thank Thanks, you. Nella. And then I think our last uh, member is Tyler. Good evening, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, so I am Tyler Webb. I'm the um, assistant, one of the two assistant principals uh, at, at Weathersfield High School. And uh, simply for me, um, th this is everything that I'm all about. Um, SEL uh, kind of drives my, uh, all the work that I do, I think, especially with the students that I work with. Oftentimes, most of the kids that make their way to my office, um, unless they want to come, are coming because they uh, don't have those sort of, we talk about life skills, we talk about, um, you know, just the, the, the success skills that, that people have uh, as they grow up and become adults. And so I do a lot of my individual work with kids trying to... Um, just give them a, especially because the time is limited that we have them there in high school, try to give them the, 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 the quick and, and, and fast um, conversations with them, but, but more importantly, create relationships with them to understand that they need to, to learn how to um, speak up when they're not feeling good, um, reach out when they don't understand and obviously for teenagers, as we all know, they know everything. So um, that's oftentimes pretty hard for them. Um, but uh, th this is work that, that, like I said, is, is all about who I am. I'm actually gonna start a doctoral program in the fall um, in social, emotional, academic learning. So um, I, I, I think it's, it's absolutely critical for, for, um, for educators today, which is just so contrary to what 
I think, especially as we talk about uh, the high school, contrary to what we think about what high school is, we think about content, 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 content. And um, I think more and more, it's these, uh, these skills that, that really are critical in trying to build learners um, amongst, amongst all kids who come to high school. So sorry, long. We'll, we'll try to keep it brief and I'll give it back to <laughs> Stephanie. Thanks, Tyler. Um, so, and yep, we'll skip this slide. Thank you. So we had a great committee. Um, we met at, I think it was 7, 10 in the morning on Thursday mornings for uh, a couple of months. And we had some really great, rich conversations um, focused on many of the things that our elementary and middle school colleagues already mentioned, but looking at student SEL, adult SEL, and how we can all use these skills to better ourselves, better our teaching, and, and help our students along. But we, it, it was a great group and it really was a pleasure to work with everybody. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. And much like the other ones, our why, um, what we're focusing on, um, really, you know, it, it's all about the kids. You know, we want them to be able to learn how to handle their emotions. We're looking at the kids first as people. Um, and when the kids are emotionally available, they're available to learn as well. So these are all, um, we're just kind of reiterating what, what, our, what the elementary and middle school teachers already said. Um, and then one more slide for me, please. Yeah, and our essential question, um, how does SEL integrate with equity, which is something very important to our school and our district? Uh, me ask recommendations for accreditation, which is something that we've been working on for the past few months. Um, restorative practices, which is something that Tyler alluded to a little bit earlier. And vision of the graduate, which is something that we've been working on at the um, school level and working with the middle school on that and it's something we're kind of we're bringing into our curriculum. So we have a lot of changes going on all for the good. And there's lots of ways that we can incorporate SEL into that. Um, so I think I'm done and I think we're moving on to Nella. Thank you. Okay, so um, for my part, I think I'm not muted now. Everyone can hear me, hopefully. Um, awesome, thanks, Steph. And so we looked, the school things we looked at, it was important that the program um, meet um, CASEL standards and have evidence um, be supported by evidence. So those were the programs that we looked at. Um, additionally, we wanted to make sure that the, sele that the selection provided explicit instruction in social emotional skills that would make it easier for the um, implementation. And in the implementation, it was important that um, the model be flexible um, to meet the needs of the, at the secondary level as well. Of course, um, still to do um, on our agenda is you know, to create a system for which a teachers can be supported in the implementation um, within their classroom and curriculum as well as a system of like, how do we review and follow up to make sure that the implementation is successful and stays you know, on track or it can be tweaked as we need it. So it was important for the programs to have all these um, components. So if we go to the next slide. Thank you. So um, the timeline, we actually started our work, I guess, a little bit later than the elementary and middle school. Um, we started it around January where we actually really reviewed, you know, what the focus would be and what our essential question is. As you can tell, there's a lot of irons um, in the fire and it was important that how do we, um, I think social emotional learning actually really brings all these different things together. Um, so we discussed about, I think, eight to maybe it was nine different models and programs and we were able to narrow the list down to two to three and then in fe February we went even further looking at the indicators more closely especially as it related to school-wide um, social emotional learning and um, what was explicitly available in the instruction and when we saw the um, vendor presentations that provided us a deeper look into the models, the final two that we had uh, decided on at that point, which was Leader Me and Dream Ed. And it helped us as we moved forward to really create a pro con, what are the concerns, what, are, uh, what, were th what was the best fit, and to help us make um, our final decision. Um, in 
you know, the concerns that we have like going forward into um, April is, okay, so we need to introduce this um, and present to our leadership team at the high school. Um, additionally, we want to make sure that we can um, make decisions on how it would be incorporated into classes and the various parts of our curriculum so that it's seamless and really supports the overall school climate um, as well. And also that it incorporates also the vision of the graduate that we're working really hard um, to make sure it's part of our NASC accreditation that we've put together. And the changing curriculum requirements as well for the high school where we're looking to create a mastery-based credit um, course or um, experience that students could take advantage of. So the potential was really for this product to really help us hone and put together um, all these different things that we're working on at the high school. So with that, then we decided on the big reveal. Um, now I'm gonna introduce you to Alicia again. She'll speak about um, this section, our final choice. So three for three, we also chose Rethink Ed. <laughs> um, uh, and if you wanna go to the next slide, just quickly, there are a few images. Um, from, you know, from the curriculum. And I think something that was appealing, and you can kind of see this in the imagery, is that, you know, it did feel developmentally appropriate. Um, I think kids can kind of sniff out when something feels like too young or, um, so that kind of spoke to us. I think um, you can kind of see it here and we can go to the next slide, just that it does feel like, um, so what does Rethink think I'd offer? Um, we like that, uh, it provides video modules for adult learning. So it gives teachers the opportunity um, to kind of hone their skills before bringing this to the kids. Um, it focuses on both adult and student SEL and does feel, um, again, kind of developmentally on target for high school age kids. Um, it provides SEL education for all students with differing interventions, which felt really important. You know, um, I think it was Diana who said that, um, you know, every year it's a different group. You have a different set of needs and um, being able to have some flexibility felt, felt important and valuable. Um, Rethink has professional learning, uh, their assessments, their different curricula, behavior supports um, and progress monitoring, all of which, um, and to, you know, kind of have all of those on one platform felt, you know, that it would be kind of streamlined and um, an, an effective way to kind of deliver this instruction. Um, what can we do with it? Um, we felt that we could personalize this and make it our own. Um, you know, as teachers of specific subjects, being able to have the flexibility to kind of, you know, again, put this into um, our own classrooms in an authentic way felt important. Um, we have the flexibility to implement in a variety of ways. Um, and also, as, as Nella kind of touched on, um, and Steph, the idea that we can align this with um, the vision of the graduate with, um, you know, social justice initiatives and um, that there's the potential for this mastery based credit opportunity all felt um, like important um, assets that that rethink provides. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tyler if there are any questions. Yeah, actually, before we get to the question stage for all groups, I also want to um, uh, introduce three more people. They're integral to the committee work that's happened, uh, who didn't have specific slides to speak to, but Rosalind Bannon, the principal of the middle school. Rosalind, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your support or? Sure, absolutely. This has been an absolutely um, engaging process and a fantastic process. And um, SEL, like Patrick has said, and like Tyler said, as administrators, this is near and dear to our hearts. Because we know that if students aren't available emotionally, they're not going to be available to learn the lessons that we're teaching them. So this is just so, so important, especially as we emerge out of this pandemic and education evolves out of the pandemic. We really have to shift our focus to the social emotional needs of the students. And it's become more and more apparent as more and more kids are coming back to school that um, this pandemic has traumatized many students and that what school looks like now is quite a bit different. So the focus on social emotional learning right now is 
couldn't be any more timely and any more necessary than what it is right now. And we really are shifting our mindset to what's fair for one isn't fair for all in the um, spirit of equity and in keeping an equity lens throughout um, the way we deal with our students and knowing that relationships are the key to success and that those relationships that we form not only with the students but with the parents as well is key to our success and key to our students success more importantly because at the end of the day that's what we're all here for the success of our students to have them have healthy minds healthy bodies and to um, learn as much as they possibly can learn from us so that they can be um, contributing members of society and um, be proud of all that they do. And we can be proud of the work that we've done with them. Thank you, Rosalind. And we also have John Kazar, Director of Special Services and Liz Freitas, uh, Instructional Supervisor for Special Services. John and Liz. I can't see everybody on my screen, so I'm sorry. Well, I don't know if well, Liz isn't going first, I will. Liz, you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, <laughs> it's the Zoom Google switch. Um, it, it's just it's it's been an amazing journey over the past four months. Um, and, and this presentation just highlights all the tremendous work that our teachers, curriculum specialists, um, our building administrators have put into assuring that our students are receiving um, what they need and that we're addressing the whole student, um, not just solely looking at academics, but assuring that they're they're in a place where they feel safe um, and that they're in a place where they'll learn these skills. So I, I just wanna highlight the tremendous work that the committees did, that the teachers put forward um, on top of everything that they do every day, what they, what they had to offer and to assure that we pick the right program for Wethersfield Public Schools. Thanks, Liz. And I, I guess I first wanna say how proud I am of the district. And we actually started this process September 1st, we were gonna move forward with second step. And I'm most proud because people saw that there's some inequities and microaggressions with second step. And instead of letting that go and saying, ah, no problem, they thought about our students and the students that would impact the most. And they said, no, we cannot do that. And so with this, even though I was like, oh, September 1st, we need to start SEL. I think we got SEL so much further by looking at an inclusive at, you know, attitude where everyone could fit in. And I think it started to teach us how to challenge our curriculum, how to look at our curriculum, um, really in critical manners of how it reaches our students. And um, at one point I thought we were gonna have three different curriculums and I was like, oh, um, and, you know, honestly, they all came to this point all by themselves and really three very different processes, uh, 7, 10 in the morning till, uh, oh, what, yeah, Wednesday, we went from 7, 10 till 3.30 um, doing SEL. It was amazing and um, really so proud of the work they've done and, um, and that they're going to do because the hardest part's yet to come, implementation, because we know staff has so much going on right now. But we know that through this, that we can help ourselves and to help our students. And uh, just one, and I've shared this story so I'll, with the um, committees, but I'll share it again. Um, I have a wide range of friends. I've uh, been a high school principal for many years. I've had a lot of friends and students that have had a lot of success and some that haven't had much success. And as of today, I've never known anyone who's been fired from a job because of math skills, English skills, social study skills, uh, foreign language skills. I mean, it all helps them, but they've been fired because of social emotional skills. How to uh, emotional, you know, regulate emotions, how to interact with others, um, how to deal with frustrations. And so that's really what will provide our students with success, having those skills. And so thank you all. Board members we provided a lot of information, uh, questions, comments from you. I have a, oh, I'm sorry, Bobby, go ahead. No, okay. well, first I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. And that goes to elementary, the middle school and the high school um, for doing all this work and for coming up with the same program. That's pretty good. 
Um, my only question through the whole thing, and there was so much information, and I couldn't agree with you more that social and emotional learning is so important, especially right now. Um, in May, you're gonna do professional development. Are the teachers gonna be given anything? Uh, you know, is this vendor said, well, here's your scope and sequence booklet, or here's, um, you know, a computer guide for you. Are you getting anything that will guide you in this program, in this? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we will have, uh, it's all web-based. It's all um, on a kind of software platform. So we will have access, um, you know, by the end of this month, uh, for all teachers. And so the idea that came across in um, many of the committees was let's introduce it so they become familiar with the platform, the software. And many of our teachers are gonna wanna do a few lessons or a lesson on their own uh, near the end of the year, especially as we wind down in spring and people get a little antsy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a great time to be able to kind of try and explore it. Um, some teachers might wait till the fall. We're gonna do some follow-up professional development back in August as we come back to prepare to implement. Um, so what we won't have are, are kind of how we sketch out the lessons and the order, the themes and which months, but they will have full access to the platform to be able to go in and try a lesson and do it on their time. Um, and those of people that wanna wait till the fall for full implementation can do that also. So it gives some flexibility to our staff um, depending upon their their needs and their time schedule um, to either try a little bit this this fall and this spring or wait till the fall. So all this information is going to be on the platform of a, a computer design. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Bobby, just with it too, um, I think three different processes, it's going to look different at all three levels, even though it's the same program. And uh, one thing great about Rethink Ed, they provide coaching of implementation. Um, and I do, and I know Julie's here, uh, uh, but I really do look at our related service staff also of helping with that coaches of, you know, of them uh, really, you know, digging into it more uh, because they really are our main coaches uh, for SEL. That's great. That's a great asset. That's great. Yeah. Kelly? Thanks. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and all the work behind this. I think just having all I was thinking while you were presenting it is I wish I had something like this to like make my staff and finance do because I feel like it would benefit them as adults and me so um and as a kid as a parent of a child that's just a worrier I think it's fantastic um and they're young and I just love how, how I'm seeing what's going to go on in um, for them as they get older can I just have one question because I was kind of excited about the um the support for parents, because as a parent that has none, like sometimes my, my own kids completely stun me with their ability to talk about their feelings and what they're feeling and how they can do different things um, that I feel like you know, they're, they're better at it than I am. Um, so I'm excited to hear that there's some support to parents. Can you explain to me what that might look like? Does anybody want to take that question? If not, I can start it off. So uh, Kelly, there's a few things. There are parent letters. So along with the lesson, there are some tools for teachers to communicate home with parents to be able to use some common vocabulary and strategies, um, especially as buildings will be doing similar themes. Uh, so for example, um, self-control might be a theme um, within a week or a month. And so there'll be some multiple teachers talking about that and, and using the same language. And again, then that would be a strategy and a theme that you could also support at home. Um, there's also a parent resource sec section where parents can log in and see some of the same videos and resources um, that our teachers use with um, uh, students. Um, so those people that are looking for more information and do you know, some reading or some learning around that topic, um, there will be a parent section that um, we are going to explore some more on. Um, I don't think that you know, every parent's going to log in there looking for that, but for those parents that are asking for more information, we have some resources built to point them in the right direction, which will be a nice connection to support, again, some students that might need some additional support and having some common language between school and home will be important. That sounds awesome. I'm really excited. And I, I loved everything that we were saying. So I wish I could, I want to learn. I want to learn it. But um, thank you guys so much for uh, all the work you put behind it. I think this is just critical for all of our kids. And I'm really, really excited for my own and all of our students just to kind of grow in this space. I think it's so important. Thank you.
Any other questions? Jim? Thanks so much. That was a great presentation and thanks for all the hard work. I think it's great that uh, all, of, all of the schools selected the same uh, program. So I think that's gonna be uh, very helpful. And I think it's great that, uh, that there's you know, some access for teachers um, as well as parents. So thank you. Great, well, um, I just wanna show to all our committee members that are here tonight and our committee members that aren't here, as you saw, we had very large committees. Um, as John said, our work is not done. We're still on that implementation journey and we'll support uh, and you know, as, as our journey continues. Um, so we, I think, our, I think our high school meeting might be tomorrow, John. I think it's Thursday. I could be wrong, but you thought you, thought you missed it. No, no uh, it's not. we didn't it's miss it. Wednesdays. Ah, uh, see, I was trying to trick them. Um, but we're still working. But thank you for coming tonight. Uh, your time is valuable, and you're busy. And it's St. Patrick's Day, so go have a Guinness, science people. Uh, you're on board next. Uh, so greatly appreciate you coming and sharing your expertise and perspectives. So social emotional committee people, thank you very much. Yeah. Please don't stay uh, on. Thank you. Can you. Sign off. Thank you for everything, people. Unbelievable job. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And then we're going to move to my, my other favorite topic is science. Mine um, too. So for uh, those of you that uh, don't know, I'm a, I'm a, I, I shouldn't say former science teacher. Once a science teacher, always a science teacher, right? So um, another one of my favorite topics, I think I have a lot of favorite topics, but um, a love is a science curriculum. So tonight um, we have uh, several people here to talk about some of our science curriculum revisions um, as we shift our curriculum towards um, the new site. Well, I shouldn't say new. I say new, but now they're several mm -hmm. years old and then we had a pandemic uh, on top of it. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to um, Anne and the teachers. And as you um, kind of get to your part, you can introduce yourself. I think that'll be more efficient with time. Yep. Okay, so hi, I'm Ann Malloy. I'm Content Curriculum Specialist at Hamner and Highcrest Schools. Um, and I'm here with Becky Granatini, who was in our last, um, in your last meeting. Ryan Boothroyd, grade six at Highcrest and Summer Cookson, grade four, EW and Joy DePolis, grade two at Hamner. Um, so I wanna tell you a little bit about, um, we're here to talk about our science units that we're bringing forward for curriculum adoption and to share some of the great work that our teachers have been doing in science with their students. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about our process because this has been a labor of love since um, 2016 when the standards first um, were adopted. We started a district-wide um, science committee. It was a professional learning committee where we all dug into the standards. Uh, we tried to figure out what they were all about. Um, we looked at how they were written um, and the fact that they are written three-dimensionally and they include a science and engineering practice, disciplinary core idea, and a cross-cutting concept in each of the, they're called performance expectations, um, of which students should be able to do by the end of the unit. Um, so, so these standards were all laid out um, and we really needed to figure out how can we implement these with our students. So in order to do that, we, we put our student hats on um, for our committee work. Um, and we actually dug into the standards as a committee of learners. Um, and then our committee members helped design and facilitate professional development with staff in much the same way. So our committee has worked tirelessly to develop tools for teachers to use to help assess the science and engineering practices at each grade level, and we will continue to do this work. Um, so just going back uh, in 2017, 2018, we had our teacher leaders helping to roll out professional development. Um, and then from 2018 to 2020, pretty much teachers have been piloting various units. Um, in the summer of 2019, we were able to bring a team of teachers and curriculum specialists together in the summer uh, to gather and, and write curriculum. And this was a, uh, a three-year plan, which has been delayed due to the pandemic. But we are here today to um, roll that, that, uh, that curriculum out to you. And Becky? A lot of um, what's going on with our, um, our curriculum writing has really been focused on inquiry. 
Um, and that's one of the most exciting parts about NGSS. And we've talked about it a little bit before, but um, you know, just as a refresher, um, sort of our guiding philosophy now is the idea that you're, the stu our students are no longer a disseminator or we are no longer a disseminator of knowledge, um, rather that we're curators of curiosity. Um, and our science, so much of what we've been working on with teachers, yes, we're writing the curriculum. We're also side by side. We're also um, supporting great pedagogy, right? Like we're, we're working with teachers to, um, you know, in processes to support inquiry, providing students with phenomenon and then giving them teaching into the skills of how do you research? How do you build investigations to answer the questions that you have? And then how do you actually make a claim and support it with evidence and reasoning? Um, so we've, it's really been an awfully exciting process. And as we implement each of these different um, new sort of parts to our curriculum, um, it's been phenomenal to walk into classrooms and to see this happening with our students. So it's a wonderful guiding philosophy um, that's leading us to some really exciting times in science education. Okay. so. Um... I, I put two graphics on this slide. And if we look at the graphic on the left, it's the typical flow of an NGSS unit. So each inquiry unit um, is designed to follow a similar flow with the science and engineering practices embedded throughout the unit. Basically, every unit begins with an anchoring phenomenon, as you can see on the left, where students um, work in groups to discuss what they notice and wonder, and then they share their initial ideas. Next, they draw a model to explain what they can and cannot see. And after viewing each group's shared model, they identify questions that they will need to answer in order to explain the phenomenon. Each unit integrates research and investigations and lots of talk in an attempt to make sense of the anchoring phenomenon. If you think of it as a giant puzzle, students keep adding pieces to the puzzle until it is complete and they are able to once again return to the anchoring phenomenon at the end of the unit and fully explain it using newly acquired academic language that they learn throughout the unit. If you take a look at the graphic on the right, you're gonna notice that it's color-coded. And this color-coded, um, like I said, it was a three-year plan. Our green units um, were the ones that were, were uh, they're finished, they have been, teachers have been trained and the curriculum is, is done. And those are the ones that we're bringing forth to you today. Um, these uh, teachers have received training on their yellow units as well, that they are currently in draft form. And the red units are in process. So some teachers were in the midst of piloting when the pandemic hit and some units um, we are still looking to explore resource, resources. Now we plan to reconvene our committee and resume our work in moving forward with our science curriculum writing, choosing materials for the units which have not been finished and having our science committee teachers pilot with students next year. So we're still in the midst. There's still a lot of excitement about it. We have teachers that are exploring new things um, every day. And um, so it, you know, we just were, we had a little bit of a blip in our, in our work. So these are the units. Um, we're going to take you through a brief overview of each of the units. And I'm going to, let me see, I think I have to, can I share that? Oh, I can. I'm not super familiar with Zoom. So this is new to me as well. Okay. All right. So this is our kindergarten unit on sunlight and weather. Would you like for me to Sort of yeah, you want okay. to do that one? Sure. So in kindergarten, um, the topic is sunlight and weather. Um, and in this one, students are developing an understanding sort of of the patterns. We're looking for the patterns and the variations in our local weather. Um, and they have some fun with weather forecasting um, and, you know, sort of like looking at, you know, they might do um, actually like what you might wear during, you know, for certain types of weather, what you might expect in certain types of weather. And again, like preparing for and responding to severe types of weather. 
Um, so in this, students are expected um, to demonstrate proficiency and they, they were really working on like becoming scientific, right? Like how to, becoming scientists. Um, we want the students to start asking questions and you know developing and using models. And models is something, that's a term you're gonna hear a lot of in, um, in all science instruction. It's really sort of like the beginnings of, of understanding. It's like a visual understanding, a representation of their understanding. So they're starting to develop some models of their thinking. Um, in this, like Anne was showing you that, that kind of circle, the, the process of our scientific investigations, um, we're starting that as early as kindergarten. We're having students participate in the different parts of those, um, the, the entire inquiry process. Um, we have students sort of side by side um, carrying out investigations. We might be doing it in a more modeled way at that point, but we're still doing those kinds of investigations to start to lay the, the groundwork um, for you know students as they continue. They'll be using the same format, but of course the content will become more elevated throughout the different grade levels. And I just want to show you on this, this is like a typical um, cover sheet where we have the performance expectations here. Um, looking back and looking forward, we included like what's next on each of in each of our units. We have our learning outcomes where we have the standards in here. And then on the we have the science and engineering practices that are a focus for each unit, the disciplinary core ideas and the cross cutting concepts which are included um, down below. We have our connections to ELA and literacy and mathematics. And then underneath we have, these are all live links in our live binder. This is an awesome unit that was developed by kindergarten. It's their first unit of the year where they launch it with setting up, setting up STEAM centers to really introduce what do scientists do. So this is kind of a unit that carries through through their calendar and throughout the entire year. So this one is a real, um, neat one. So now I'll just pull up quickly and I want to, I don't want to keep you, so I want to okay. make sure we, <laughs> okay. Becky, you want to talk yeah, about? Yeah, sure. One? So um, in grade one, um, again, they're using that same inquiry process, um, but with a new content. Um, so we're, we're thinking about matter in grade one. Um, and we're thinking about the properties and the different phases of matter, um, solids and liquids in particular, um, and the role of temperature within those, right? Um, we do observations, like what do you notice about different, so observ observable, the different properties of different types of matter um, and purpose of different types of matter, what, what they might be used for. Um, so they, um, they might be looking at, you know, different types of objects. They might be weighing different substances and, and making some determinations and using that to guide some, or, you know, to provide investigations for their larger question, um, as well as size. So again, um, it, using the same format, it's, it's an interesting um, topic because, of course, there are a lot of great cross-curricular connections as well, which Ann showed us was at the bottom, right? That's one of the really nice things about these science units. They lend themselves really well to um, cross-curricular connections. Um, so that's for, that's our grade one green unit that we're, that we're sharing with you tonight. Um, and our grade, and here comes grade three. Yep. Um, and again, in grade three, we again talk about matter, but this time it's a little bit different because in grade three, we're talking about the transfer of energy throughout systems, right? So it's about matter and how it changes. So um, this time we're looking at solids, liquids. This time it, it also includes gases um, and plasma by properties and how it looks. Um, now we're gonna add also there's temperature, um, but mixing of substances as well. So there are some variations on what we saw in first grade. It looks different in third grade, but we also take a look at um, physical and chemical changes within this. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's a lot of fun. The kids love it. We do a lot of different types of experiments um, with ice cubes and different types of things, um, temperature um, and impact on those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and what other, I'm just looking at this. some great representation from teachers here. I don't want to make sure that we, um, yeah. yep. Yeah. And then earth system, this, this is one that um, we've had a 
very positive responses with um, teachers and students seem to like this one a lot. Um, water, um, this is an earth systems unit, water's role in earth spheres. Um, so the, the um, phenomenon begins with how much water is there on earth and does the amount of water change over time? That's kind of like the guiding um, phenomenon. And there are lots of um, investigations and simulations that go along with that um, in lots of different ways that they're observing and collecting data. It's a lot of fun to walk into the classrooms when they're doing this. They have all different kinds of charts going. They have you know, really large uh, rolls of paper kind of rolled out where they're keeping track of, of um, you know, almost like bar graphs where they'd be keeping track of different amounts of water. So. Um, it's a, it's a highly interactive unit and the kids um, seem to really, really enjoy this one. Um, so. And they use mystery science to teach this unit. Yeah, uh, mostly. Yep, so it's, yeah highly engaging for them. Okay, um, and now I'm gonna talk to you about the sixth grade a little bit. So um, sixth grade, we're bringing two units to be uh, adopted and I'm gonna go through the little mini unit with you. And this one is cells. So I'll tell you a little bit about the middle school process because the, the middle school standards are lumped with, uh, the sixth grade standards are lumped with the middle school six through eight. So the curriculum specialists and I, Becky and, and Sarah Johnson went up to the middle school several times um, to do some of this work. And we actually took all of the performance expectations and we had them printed out on sheets of paper and we actually laid them all out. We worked with the seventh and eighth grade science teachers to then determine which performance expectations were going to be taught at each grade level and which ones made the most sense. Um, so that's kind of how we did that work. And we also, Diana Beardsley was um, a lead in that as well, because she did, she did a lot of committee work with us. So we, we kind of planned that out. And this cells unit um, helps to prepare students for the deeper work that they'll do in cells in seventh grade. So it's a, it's a little mini unit that, that um, our seventh grade teachers had said, this would be an awesome way to get them introduce to the structure and function of cells and prepare them for seventh grade. So they do do a little bit of work um, with that. And like I said, it is a mini unit. It's only, it's a two week intended. It's usually done towards the end of the school year and it helps to get them ready for middle school. So I'm gonna go back to my slides. Okay. And now I'm gonna introduce Joy DePolis, who's our grade two teacher. Um, and she's gonna to talk to you about our forces and interactions, pushes and pulls unit. Hello, thumbs up if you can hear me. I can only see Sally. Okay, <laughs> okay great. Okay, hi everybody. Um, well, before me was the SEL and I think the two most important things for me as an elementary teacher is SEL and science. So what a great night and uh, combo together. Um, I often say I'd like to teach science, everything through science. And I think this unit is really um, captivates that. So what we do is we, I have a picture there and you can see two, hey, there's Georgia, Kelly. I don't know if you're still here. Um, <laughs> So that's Kelly's daughter, Georgia, when I had her, and that's a catapult that she built. And then there's another pair of girls next to her up in the top, and they built a catapult. That's actually the culmination of the unit. And we actually just begin with simple motions of push and pull, and we get the vocabulary out there. And we're reading, and we're researching, and then it's actually a writing unit. It's not science, it's not a reading unit, it's actually a writing unit, but it's such a great, I, I keep saying it's the triangle, reading, writing, and science. And I don't know how much better you can get than that from a teacher's point of view, and then throw in NGSS. And all I have to say is, I wonder, what do you think about that? I don't have to do anything, it's just beautiful. I'm so curious about that. And it's just great. Kids actually will write a lab report and we are scientists and we write like scientists and we start from day one. We'll model one and then it just goes into um, studying the words. We, we pose questions, we hypothesize, we conduct experiments, we write the data, we look at the data, we analyze the data. So there's our math. We look at the results of the lab report, and then at the end, we conclude and think, 
how now what questions do we have about the world? So it is just so highly engaging. It's a wonderful way. It's in the writer's workshop informational unit and it's just great. So there's mystery dugs that go along. There's a picture down at the bottom. And if you wanted to see what a mystery dug was, this is, I, I the link is there. I think Summer was the one who did that after me, but um, you can actually see a mystery dug lesson. And these are two kids. It brings in engineering. They're, it's just push pins on a cardboard and a ping pong ball. And that's it. The catapults catapult ping pong balls. It's ping pong balls are flying all over the room. Compare that to cotton balls. It's it's just amazing. And then we're writing about it and then we're reading and researching. So it's just it's just so much fun. Um, so students are able to design and conduct the experiments. Um, it's so integrative. It's so engaging. They use matchbox cars at the beginning down ramps. And so they learn all about that. Um, it, it's just a wonderful unit. Um, and I love the whole science, the NGSS. I'm working on another one of the units and that's the plant life. And you can see some of the corn that we use. And then we do a whole um, phenomenon with that. And I actually have right now in my classroom corn that's about two feet high that actually grew from one kernel. It actually has mini corns on it from the fall. And it's been sitting on the radiator and it's amazing. Um, there's also Skype a scientist. So I don't know if you guys have heard about that. There's a picture of, a, of, of my class down there Skyping with a scientist. We did that two years ago. He was actually in the US forestry um, field. And we actually got this picture posted in one of their publications. And it just said a school in Connecticut. So how fantastic was that? There's checklists. It's, it's, just, it's just a great unit. So um, I guess yes. you can tell. I love science. <laughs> I, I know. Joy is my girl. Um, she's been working with us from the start and she continues to, to pilot uh, units for us. That that corn unit that she does is one of my favorites. And we will definitely that will that one will be going into final uh, draft form because uh, it's just wonderful. It's a wonderful way to launch science. They usually do it in the fall with harvest corn. And it starts with a phenomenon where she talks about her husband leaving the corn out in the water. And, and then they have to try to figure out, is it alive? What's going to happen? And it's really neat how it actually grows right from the cob. So it's real. It, it's a, that's a fun one, too. But we, we have tried... Um, it, as we were working on curriculum, we tried to connect it to our reading and writing units wherever possible. So um, this is a, a, a TC unit for reading and writing, ELA, and we just connected the science content to it. And it just, um, it works beautifully because the more you can make connections, then the, the better it is for our kids. Joy, are you all set? Yeah, I'm all set. I think we go to summer next. Okay. Summer Meyer. Oh, oh, there you go. I think you're. Are you muted, Summer? You're... It doesn't say you're muted. Oh. Okay. Oh, can you hear me? I think I can hear you now. Okay. Sorry, my my computer froze. So, yep. <laughs> Hopefully it'll work. <laughs> Technology is lovely when it works. And it's always right when I'm about to present something. That's when it freezes up. Exactly. I could You're hear good. the whole rest of the meeting fine. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm going to talk about our survival and adaptations unit. It is a wonderful unit. It's super engaging for the kids. Anytime kids can talk about animals and nature, they are all in. Um, so this one is also tied into some of our reading and writing units. Um, this unit actually started as two smaller units that we combined into one large unit that we teach over the course of two different bends, kind of a similar setup to how we do our readers and writers workshop, um, where we have that one big idea and then we build on it in the second bend. Um, so the first um, half of the unit, we start with our little phenomenon there. Um, would you mind clicking the link just so they could see? It's really short. Sure. Uh, and so it, it's very quick. We watch this owl um, catch a mouse. 
Oh, I'm not looking. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is a little trigger warning before the video saying it might okay. be shocking. <laughs> um, so um, we watch that video and then the students start asking questions, um, wondering, okay, well, you know, the owl caught the mouse, but how, why? Um, and then they start asking all sorts of questions. Well, the mouse was white and the snow was white. And how did the owl get their talons to go around the, the mouse? And how did, then they start thinking about the inner workings of the owl and, okay, it's muscles and it's brain and how it had to see the, the animal. And so it keeps going. And as we go through the unit and this uh, unit comes through mystery science or this parts of this unit come through mystery science, um, they really do a lot, great job with modeling. Um, they do like a cow eyeball dissection. The kids don't do it in class. They do it on the screen and we watch and then we, um, we make our own uh, models of eyeballs using um, magnifiers, like those little credit card magnifiers that you put keep in your uh, wallet. And they notice how the light comes in and the amount of light and how that affects um, the image that's projected. Um, and so that first half of the unit, it's called the human machine, and it's all about the structure and how things work for living things to move. The second bend of the unit, we, now that they know that every living thing has this structure that helps it survive, we start thinking about how um, animals and living things need to survive in their environment. We talk about um, you know, we actually start looking at fossils, which is fun because it's something they haven't done really, you know, they mm -hmm. all get so interested in dinosaurs when they're in like first grade and they don't get to do it as bigger kids. And then um, in this unit, they start looking at fossils again, noticing what can the fossils tell us? Um, how did these animals live in their environments? Um, and then we know that some of these animals survive and some might not have survived and then what caused that. So um, we start thinking about uh, structural and behavioral adaptations, um, which goes back into our first part of our unit where we're looking at the human body um, and the, you know, the different systems in animals. Um, you know, as you can see in some of these pictures, these were pictures from the beginning of last year where we were imagining life without thumbs. So the kids took uh, masking tape and taped down their thumbs. They were trying to tie their shoes, put on a sock, open a door, pick up change, write their name. Um, things that were definitely more challenging and they had their data sheets um, because as scientists, we're always collecting our data. We're trying to report it. We're learning to create our own data tables and report out our information in an organized way. We share our information with the other scientists in the class so we can compare data and see um, if we have a consensus. Um, and the, you know, they're constantly answering these big questions. Um, one of the other things that we do in the second half of the unit is um, we use some resources from Science A to Z, which is another great resource we have. Um, one of my favorite things on there are these mystery I files. And so it's a set of different articles that there's about six articles in the set and they have this big question. So in this case, it's how do animals depend on their environment to survive? And so each article talks about a different environment and what the kids do is that they work in their groups and they notice the similarities between the articles. And so, um, you know, again, it's reading, writing, looking across text, synthesizing and bringing their ideas together to come up with a, another big idea. So not only do, are they doing the simulations but they're also getting the research part of it, um, which is wonderful. So, um, oh, and you know, there's some other great things I wanted to talk about too. I, I could go on all night, but I won't. Um, but there's this other great simulation we do that's like a game and that we talk about the changes in the environment. And um, they, it's um, about the brown and the green anoles down in Florida and how the brown anoles were actually an invasive species. And so if you go to Florida, now compared to you know 25 30 years ago you used to see all the green anoles now you see the brown anoles who because they actually eat the green anoles um and so the kids do a simulation oh i'm am i frozen up i think i'm frozen no not you well, no i'm not you. okay your you voice guys are frozen not frozen your just hand. just your picture but you, we can still hear you okay um and that so they do the simulation um where they 
each of them has different adaptations for their null babies. Um, some of them have more. Uh. <laughs> nope, Summer, we lost you. Yeah, we lost, we lost you, yeah. We lost, we lost, um, we lost your video, we lost you both. If they survive or not. <laughs> Because my, my computer keeps saying it's unstable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And so um, that's a little bit about the fourth grade unit. Again, it's wonderful. And I'll turn it over to Ryan for uh, sixth grade. OK. Hi, I'm Ryan Boothright. I teach sixth grade at High Crest. Um, I'm going to be talking about our waves and electromagnetic radiation unit. We actually start the year with this unit. Um, I've taught it now for about three years. Um, the students love starting the year with a hands-on science um, unit where we first start to explore um, how waves have a pattern of specific wavelength, frequency, and amplitude. So the students are investigating properties of sound and light waves, which is interesting. I used to teach fifth grade and knowing having that background really helped me to learn more, you know, teaching this unit, which is really helpful. And they discover patterns that occur with these types of waves. So the initial phenomenon that we do is the students investigate the electromagnetic spectrum, and then they use that to form their ideas and generate questions. So we, I've used breakout rooms a lot this year. So that was such a helpful tool in order to build science discussion, um, really having students interact with each other and building their initial ideas. Talk and discussion is so important in science and really uh, you've seen throughout each of the units that we've talked about really having the students engage in their ideas and talk with each other and build um, through their collaboration is really helpful. So in order to design a scientific experiment, the students learned about independent and dependent variables and constants when conducting investigations. So this year we used a program called Chrome Music Lab and you can see on the, on the slide there. So students were using this program where they were looking at the appearance and the sound, the appearance of the sound waves based off of the volume or the pitch. So using that Chrome Music Lab allowed them to explore how the volume and the pitch of the sound affects the appearance of the sound waves. Um, I also taught them how to write procedures and they tested their experiment using Chrome Music Lab. After they tested their experiment, they researched properties of waves and they connected their research to their data from their investigation. So they use their data and their research to write a claim with evidence and reasoning, which you heard you know, that was a big part of the scientific practices. Um, they've adjusted their evidence and reasoning to include precise scientific vocabulary that they had learned through their research and in our breakout room discussions. So that's kind of like the first part of our unit was looking at sound waves and how volume and pitch affected the sound waves. And you could see an example of a student's claim with their evidence and reasoning. So the second part of our unit was about how waves are reflected, absorbed, or transmitted. So students learn the characteristics of a science model, which you heard Anne mentioned before, modeling is so important, and really looking at their initial models and their final models and seeing what they've learned throughout the unit is really amazing. So they've learned the characteristics of the model, and they used the anchor chart that we created with properties of a model to describe their initial uh, thoughts about how light travels and how it's reflected, absorbed, or transmitted. So this year, we were really creative with how we shared our science models. So there's a platform called Padlet that we've been using in all content areas. And I was able to put uh, students' models on Padlet, and they were able to um, engage in discussion based off of each other's models. So they were asking questions. They were giving initial ideas. They were giving feedback about models. And we use that to help determine our driving questions for the unit as well. Um, they research light waves using various nonfiction texts, online videos, and websites to determine how light waves are reflected, absorbed, or transmitted. Um, some of the hands-on experience that we did in class, there's a picture of one of them there. Um, we use mirrors and flashlights to explore angle of incidence and angle of reflection. We also used the flashlights with prisms to determine how light is refracted and how colored paddles, we use colored paddles as well to determine how colors are absorbed or reflected. And then we also looked at, um, we had two containers where one, they were both filled with water, but one was wrapped in black and one was wrapped in white. And we measured the, the temperature throughout the day outside. And we looked at how black absorbs more than white does. And that was really engaging for them to see how black absorbs more than white. 
Um, so to conclude our unit, they wrote their claim about how light waves are reflected, absorbed, or transmitted. And then you can see an example of a final model there demonstrating what they've learned throughout the unit. And it's really remarkable to compare their initial models versus their final models. And it's awesome when the students really see that too. I'm actually finishing up my weather unit this week and we do multiple investigations throughout that unit. And it's amazing how much they've learned because I give them the guiding questions on their initial model and they go, I don't know anything about this. That's okay, that's what you're gonna be learning during our unit. And now to see them when they're making their final model, oh wow, I know all about air pressure. I know all about cold, in, uh, cold and warm fronts. So it's awesome to see what they've learned throughout the unit and to see that reflected in their final models. Okay. All right. This just makes my heart so happy. And I just want, wanted to thank the teachers for coming to share. Um, it's amazing. You're, you're doing such awesome work in science. Um, so I'm not sure if you have any questions or comments for us um, regarding our curriculum process and, and what we're doing. If you wanted to learn more about, you heard us mention the um, science and engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, cross-cutting concepts, you could go to nextgenscience.org and learn more about um, each one of those things because that's what we use to guide um, our curriculum writing. Ian, I have a question. Yeah. First yeah. of all, Ian, it's so good to hear you. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I'm in awe. I really am at what these students are doing because these teachers are teaching them um, what a real scientist does. And I do remember the second grade one that was related to um, Lucy Calkins. And it really is an amazing thing to see what these children are capable of doing. But that's mm -hmm. number one. Number two, because of this pandemic, have we been able to do partnering and working together and uh, doing graphs together and well, acting like real scientists would? Right. Has that kind of been put on the shelf for a while? So it just, it looks different, Bobby. Um, we, we've done, we've integrated some teacher modeling. We have students, uh, we've created kits. We ordered a lot of materials so that we could create sure. kits so that students don't have to share their materials, but they're working side by side. Um, and then they're doing a lot of discussion at a distance or in a breakout room. So it does look different, but they are still engaged. Bobby, I also kind of, I, uh, I differentiated by having the students that were at home, maybe doing the research portion and the students that were in school doing the hands-on experiments. And yes, you had a couple students that were full remote learners, so I kind of prepped them with their families that might, it might be an experiment that they could do at home. So for example, we did uh, the egg in the bottle doing air pressure. So I kind of prepped them, you need a hard boiled egg, you need a plastic bottle so you can do this at home. So they were able to do those experiments at home with us, but trying just to vary the research portion versus the, um, the hands-on experiments in class and varying that really worked out in terms of having, you know, when we were in the hybrid learning where your students were there only two days a week. No. And it even worked for second grade. So like with the corn, we prepped ahead of time. It was prepping ahead of time. That was the big thing. We had the packet ready. The parents were fantastic and came and picked up things for the full remote learners. I was breaking harvest corn so everyone could have some to feel at home. So um, it, it just took a lot of extra prepping um, and a little bit of adjusting here and there, but I think the corn unit was just as successful this fall as it was last fall. Oh, that's so good to hear. Great. And one of the moving forward, though, we're going to go back to them all working together. Oh, absolutely. Right. I, I think it's been amazing. Um, Ryan touched upon it when he was talking about creating padlets so that the kids could still do their gallery walks, which is a really important part of that cycle that Ian talked about. Finding ways to kind of carry out, we created virtual bookshelves, um, which allowed for online reading um, so kids could then do their research, but with online books. There were also jam boards, which are ways of, you know, it's, it's like what we were showing during SEL with the little sticky notes. They look like sticky yeah. notes. Um, that's actually a feature that they can use to, for kids to be able to put in their ideas about what's going on in a phenomenon. So right. um, it was incredible to see sort of like, as I mentioned, like the, the pedagogy, right? Like we had like one or two years to kind of really teach into that. 
but then the teachers were like off and running and we were going through all of the all these different um possible resources the 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 padlet the jamboard um virtual bookshelves all of these different things putting them into play so that the kids still could move through the cycle albeit um a slightly at home bringing the corn home then doing the virtual bookshelf it, it was a little different than it typically would be but i think we got a lot of the key elements in so it was really it was it was fascinating to see how quickly it evolved what an awesome job you people did awesome i agree thank you so much for the presentations um <clears throat> I loved, um, we're big, we're big lovers of Miss Polis in this house. So I loved her <laughs> presentation. Um, I remember when Georgia did that and she was fantastic and she's in fourth grade now and she's telling me all about science. And I have a uh, first grade, the science is so much fun and it looks so much different than, you know, what I was used to. So thank you so much for being here at like eight o'clock on St. Patty's Day to walk yeah. us through all of this. <laughs> it was awesome. But that's why for the board, this is the best committee to be on. Because <laughs> you're most interesting. It really it changes so fast. Um, <laughs> I have to say, though, that, that all of these teachers, uh, uh, there's one word that keeps going through my mind, and that's persistence with a capital P, oh. right? Because the new science standards came out several years ago, uh, a, a totally teacher-led committee meeting after school on, you know, on, you know, outside of their teaching day and piloting and finding time during the day to meet and try and collaborate and order and all this on top of what everything they're doing. Um, and so please know all your time and energy uh, is you know, paying off for your students, but also students across the districts as we share these units and resources. But it has um, been highly uh, persistent. And, um, and even though we're in a pandemic, well, our, our written documents haven't changed. I still get emails about this material and that material and this pilot and Ryan, you know, Ryan wants to pilot something new and right. And so uh, that persistence and just creativity of making sure we have the best opportunity for our students is greatly appreciated. Um, and even more amazing in the middle of a pandemic. But I think that speaks to the flexibility of our teachers and they've kind of gotten a rhythm and you know, off they go and their innovation is so high that it, it's greatly appreciated. So yes, it's warmed my heart today too, so. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, is there going to be fifth grade science assessment this year? Are they gonna be? Yes. Best? Okay. And I do know the Keene Foundation after school program did have a science program that many um, students um, were part of. Yeah, yeah I think. I think every classroom or almost every classroom was involved in it. Um, and they're actually coming to do a second, or I think probably in the right in the middle of doing a second lesson for our fifth grade students right yeah. now. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, good yeah. luck on that. Good luck. Jim, anything from, any questions for you? No, great, great job. Um, really appreciate it. Um, my wife teaches science uh, in another district. So uh, uh, I think maybe she'll want to uh, take a look at this uh, presentation when it goes online, but great work. Yeah. Um, so committee, committee members, um, I just need uh, kind of your approval to move these to the full board for approval. Were you good with yeah. that? Good? Yes. Okay. Great. I'm in. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to present it, Sally, or are we going to have the teachers present some of it or? Uh, no, it'll just be for um, approval. Actually, if one of you can do the updates, again, Chris isn't here today, so at the full board, if you could just kind of, I'm sure he's going to ask one of you to do an update. Um, so it wouldn't be a full board presentation. We do our presentations here in Zoom programs and services. So um, one of you want to just kind of do a quick update on it. But I I can't replace what they just told you. They, they do this every day in every subject area. I wouldn't bring it justice, so. Deb did give us the... Um some of the slides, like the specific slides with the overview and stuff. So one of us can yeah. kind of shabbily put it You'll, forward. It's not nearly as good as what we saw today, but it's their fault for not being You'll on the do, committee. That's right. You'll do a great job. So, and we'll link the presentations into the minutes. So perfect. Well, with that said, Jim, do you think we, do we have other business? I don't think there's any other business. Um, <laughs> Kelly is saying no. no. No, we don't have any more business. So I think at, at 816, we can adjourn. And thank you guys for coming and join. Go and celebrate St. Patty's Day if you uh, are, are inclined to do so. So thank you very thank much. You. Yep. Thank, thank you very much. much.
You're right. Awesome. Good night.